Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Redberry Leo here, and welcome back to another Learn to Lead video. Now, we have been doing such a fantastic job with the Learn to Lead videos. One of them is almost over 2,000 views, which is, like, unbelievable. And it's all, like, natural just dispersion of... Oop, just natural dispersion of the material. And I really have you guys to thank for that. So thank you so much for your support, for being awesome. And I can't wait to see where this community goes. I'm just super hyped right now. I've been recording, like, a bunch of videos and editing them. And it's a lot, but I do enjoy it. So, I'm looking forward to an exciting episode of Chapter 7, Learn to Lead, with you all today. Today's video, Chapter 7, talks about schools of thought. And it talks about different types of intelligence and how we can use it in order to be effective leaders. Emotional intelligence is one of the first things discussed in this chapter. And I'm going to talk about SMSEI, which is... A little fun thing that I came up with in order to memorize the different components to emotional intelligence. I have previously covered this in a video more in depth. It's about 11 minutes long and if you would like to check it out feel free to check it out in the iCard linked above. There's self-awareness, managing your emotions, self-motivation, empathy for others, and interpersonal skills. More information again in the iCard in a video I highly suggest you check it out if you would like more detailed explanation of it. There is something called the full range leadership model, which it technically goes over, but it doesn't actually flat out say it until a later chapter. So I'm just going to go over it now. There's a mnemonic that I have called AT and T, which is absent, transactional, transformational, and it goes from low influence or no influence low influence to high influence. And then each one is divided up into sections and it's a little bit challenging to remember unless you have examples of leaders in your life that exemplify each of these areas. So first I'm gonna talk about the absent area. Laissez-faire, if you've ever heard of it, is basically the most laid back, non-involved leader you could possibly have. They just don't touch it, they just leave it alone. And that is called very passive leadership. Next, within the transactional area of the full range leadership model, the middle T, the low influence, there are two parts to management by exception. There's passive and active. When you think about passive, passive is just they get involved to fix a problem when it comes up. So that is more of like a corrective style of leadership. And then if they're active, they're actually like controlling and almost helicopter monitoring whatever the situation may be. And the next one in transactional is contingent reward. So if you get this part done, if you get this thing done, then you will be rewarded. Like you will be given money. And a lot of people in their jobs are in that contingent reward situation. So in the transformational section, it's the four eyes. So there's individual consideration, intellectual stimulation, inspirational motivation, and idealized influence. And each of those work up to being the most effective, positive leadership style. So the individual consideration is basically that each individual in the team is given time and attention. So that's kind of like one-on-one -on -one mentorship. So if you are mentoring someone or if someone is mentoring you, that's individual consideration because they're taking your ideas, your thoughts, your actions into account, and they're having discussions with you to show you that you as an individual are important to the team's success. Next is intellectual stimulation. And that means to challenge people. Inspirational motivation is to inspire people. And idealized influence is the model of leadership that we want to strive for. I'm not quite sure why I was wearing my headphones, but you know, it was interesting and I think it's time for me to have them off. So I have taken them off and we're going to move on to the next section, which talks about power. Unlimited power. Power in the leadership context is one's ability to influence another's behavior. And there are two different types of power that it talks about. There's the position power and personal power. Position power is based off of legitimacy, reward, and coercion. And then personal power is based on expertise, 
and reference. So then there's Hogbug's six steps to leadership power, which I will briefly go over. Fear, seduction, personal persuasion, model integrity, empowering, and being wise. Now, there is a, an episode of Parks and Rec that I think of where there's an argument, but not, not necessarily an argument, but there is a discussion between Ron and Chris Traeger about how to properly motivate their team members through Katumps, which is like their management training module that anyone who's in a leadership position within the government of Pawnee has to complete. And basically, Ron used the tactic of fear to have Gary put all the folders away, away. And then Chris had an empowering model of power in order to influence and help inspire Gary to put away folders. And something that I do want to mention is that using fear as a tool to motivate your people is not typically effective in the long run. There is psychology research that suggests that people who are scared don't really remember and retain information as well. And if you're yelling at them, then they're less likely to respect you and it's more out of fear that they're listening to you. So that's just something to keep in mind, like if you are leading activities at your squadron or at like encampment or something like that. So there you go. Helping each person achieve their potential is the thrust of personal mastery. And personal mastery is defined as reaching one's deepest personal and professional goals. Purpose is one's reason for being alive and personal vision is where someone wants to go. By keeping these things in mind, we can create a shared vision for the entire unit and implement procedures and activities and opportunities for everyone to achieve personal mastery and really support the group going forward. Next, I will talk about team learning and there are three aspects to this. And then with this, I created a small mnemonic for it where there's two I's and then an R that's like an uppercase R that serves as glasses to show the three different dimensions of this concept. There's insight, innovation, and roles of team members. And with these components put together, the team can learn and grow together because all individuals are being considered, like the individual consideration. They're being actively engaged, empowered, and they're motivated to get stuff done. And team learning is the process in which the team comes together, is aligned, and develops something called synergy, which is the team's ability to come together. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about mental models. There are two theories that I'm going to go into. The espoused theory and the theory in use. So the espoused one is what we claim to believe and the theory in use is what we actively are believing in, even if we don't actually claim it. Leaps of extraction happen when a team jumps to conclusions without gathering more information and testing out ideas and it's not concrete. Situational leadership is the next concept that the chapter talks about. I'm going to talk about authoritarian, de democratic, and laissez-faire leadership styles. So in some situations, it's critical that a decision has to be made. And as a commander, you need to decide right here, right now, with the information that you have, what decision you are going to make. An example, when I was the deputy commander for an encampment, there was a cadet who needed to be medevaced away. As a commander, my authoritative decision using the authoritarian um, situational leadership style was to take the entire encampment and move everyone to a completely different area where they would not be able to see all the flashing lights and the, the medevac coming to take the cadet away. And though that was a diff difficult decision for me to make and to implement because I wanted to be there to support the cadet and I'm sure a lot of people wanted to watch to make sure that the cadet got away safely, for that cadet's well-being, it's better to take the attention away from them and just move everyone physically further away, which is something that I did in that moment and wanted to ensure the best scenario for everyone. So 
there are some situations that call for an authoritative decision. However, when you are making a decision as a commander for, like, what direction the squadron should be going, or goals that we should be pursuing, something really important is to talk to your people and have a dialogue, which is representative of the democratic leadership style. And in this style, you're giving an opportunity for your people to speak, you listen to their thoughts, you take in their suggestions, and together, you come together as a team to make that decision. Even though, yes, as a leader, you will be the, the final responsibility for that decision, like when you're a commander, because you will be a commander one day, I should think, because you're watching this channel and you are awesome. And... That's something to keep in mind when you're making decisions in general. Just giving a people to giving people a chance to have their voices heard is a very important thing. Even if you have already technically mentally made that decision, people will feel respected if you listen to them. And then there's laissez-faire, where you just let the team run on their own. When I was cadet commander for encampment, for the most part, we were able to function on our own as long as we provided specific updates and met the expectations of the Commandant of Cadets and the encampment commander. Now, who here is familiar with the path goal model of leadership? Anyone? Are you familiar? Well, I don't know because I'm, I'm currently talking to my camera, but I hope that this will serve as a review after you have already read the chapter. As a reminder, if you have not read through the book, please read through it. And if you are interested in seeing more content, you can like, comment, and subscribe. I'm just adding this quickly here. I'm just saying. I will explain the path goal model of leadership now. So there's directive leadership, supportive leadership, achievement-oriented leadership, and then task and follower characteristics. And that stands for DSAT. So if you're thinking of the SAT, think, ah, DSAT. Or like VSAT, but DSAT, and then you'll you'll know what the path goal leadership model is. Directive is setting specific tasks and having expectations for those tasks. Supportive leadership is ensuring that your people's needs are being met. Achievement-oriented leadership is showing confidence in your followers' goals to obtain and go beyond what their personal goals are. Task and follower characteristics is how the leader adjusts their leadership strategy in order to properly address individuals within their team. And next is one of my favorite concepts within the book, which also is super confusing. And when I say favorite, I mean when I took my leadership test, I may or may not have done well on these questions because it's like a leadership grid. Uh, I will show the leadership grid here. Here's your leadership grid, and then it's like, what's that coordinate 1-1? One, one? What's the coordinate 5-5? Five, five? What's the coordinate 9-9? Nine, nine? And then you're like, I don't know, I don't remember. But I do have a little diagram here that you can see that shows you what each one means. 1-1 one, one is indifferent. 9-1 nine, one is controlling. 1-9 one, nine is accommodating. 9-9 nine, nine is sound. 5-5 five, five is status quo. And then if you've got like the two corners, the paternalistic, it's the 1-9 and 9-1. And then opportunistic is the four quadrants. This is a weird thing. It's used to describe the grid styles of leadership. I'm not particularly sure why it's included because of how confusing it is. But just know, like, what 1-1 one, one means, what 1-9 one, means, what 9-1 means. So know the differences between the two, like accommodating versus controlling, no status quo is in the middle, and what 9-9 nine nine means with sound. So that does it for my Learn to Lead Chapter 7 leadership video. If you do have any questions for me, please feel free to leave them in the comments down below. I appreciate your guys' support. As I said at the beginning, you guys are pretty awesome, and I look forward to seeing where this channel goes. So thank you so much for watching, and that is all, folks. Until next time, toodles.